It's now time for us to meet the co-founder of African family firms, Tsitsi Mutendi. She joins us next. Tsitsi Mutendi is a well-versed, award-winning businesswoman with over 12 years of experience building her own successful publishing and education businesses. And during this time, Tsitsi developed a passion to assist family businesses to build multi-generational entities, which then translate into legacies. Now, this passion for family business has awarded her the opportunity to be an international speaker and an author on the subject, particularly on the issues of family governance and business continuity. Thank you so much uh, for joining me, Tsitsi, and it's really wonderful to be able to hear your story. Now, my understanding is that you are a third generation family business owner. So please just share a little bit of your story with us and just tell us what the journey has been like. Thank you so much for having me, Lerato. I'm very excited to be with you today. So indeed, yes, I am a third generation family business owner. Both my grandparents from my mom and my dad's side were family business owners and my parents themselves were family business owner. And I am also a family business owner. Funny enough, um, none of those family businesses transcended from one generation to another. So we had to build our own family businesses and put in the work uh, to build our own legacies. But we kept that entrepreneurial spirit within the family. So becoming an entrepreneur for me was in the blood already. I had seen it grown up around it and I, I had inherited the spirit. So it naturally became uh, my chosen pathway in life. If I could ask, Sitsi, your grandparents and your parents, what did they do and what are the values they instilled in you to then start on your own? Let me touch on both sets of grandparents separately. On my mom's side, my grandparents, obviously, it was during the time of colonialism. And um, as African families, we really couldn't own a lot. And uh, they started their family business as a, as a partnership. Uh, with an Italian guy who um, then left the business over to them. And so my grandfather and my grandmother had a general dealer that was out in the rural areas. And it grew to be quite a well-known um, general dealer store. And I think the area, as we know them as growth points, as they were named back then, became named after my grandparents' store and their family. And then on my on my paternal side, my grandfather was a teacher, equally so it was during the colonial era. And we were, uh, as um, Native Africans, we're filling in the civil service. And he became very good at what he did as a teacher and became a headmaster, he grew up in the ranks. And um, he also was a subsistence farmer. And they, the colonial government at the time recognized him as somebody who was really good at farming and started giving him more tracts of land. So he started getting more land under uh, the native uh, program of empowering more natives. And um, he then set up a general dealer as well on one of the farms that he got. And so the, the a well-known bus stop, the general dealer became a well-known growth point. And he uh, managed to get multiple farms and he became a master farmer in the area. So he was known mm -hmm. as um, a very good farmer. He had large cattle heads, large tracts of land, farms, and to supply um, the the national GMB. So both the, both those were in the colonial area. When, when my parents obviously grew up, they both chose to go into medicine, funny enough. And my dad became... Um, medical doctor. Uh, he became the first dermatologist in Zimbabwe. My mom was um, a state registered nurse who then went on to become a midwife and then went on to become a doctor. And so when they got married, they were still very early in their careers. And as they grew within their careers, they moved to the UK for some time. And that's when I was like around three years old. When they moved back, they decided um, to set up consultancies. So they had quite a number of consultancies across our country in Zimbabwe. So we spent most of our times living out of suitcases, going from one consultancy to another as they were building this business. And um, they became well known across the country and uh, their practices well known across the country. I see the story. So an enterprising spirit of family of self-starters. And I see where the roots, the love for education and kind of social development uh, comes from in terms of your own career path. Now, let's talk about how a current rising gen can help towards building a legacy. So 
You've got the story of your grandparents to inspire you. How do you build on that to inspire those who are around you and those to come? I think it goes back to the, your previous question, which I didn't answer fully around values. When you're looking at yourself as a, as a rising gen or looking at your children as up, upcoming rising gen, one of the biggest things you take away, of, is, especially from your family, is watching them live their lives. I mean, everyday lives bring, bring with it decisions. It brings with it difficult choices at times. And it makes us out of tough stuff if we, if we stick the course. It's not easy to say, right, I am giving up everything of comfort and putting my money into providing a service or a product for a community, hoping that they're going to buy it or appreciate it. Sometimes products are way before their time and you could toil for many, many years before you actually see the results. And so you have to truly believe in what you're doing, that it's going to make a difference. And I think one of the biggest values around that is wanting to provide a service and a good to be able to contribute to the community. We all have to have that sense of wanting something bigger than what we can foresee and not just looking at uh, the dollar sign at the end of it. Uh, anyone who's been an entrepreneur at any given point in time will, can tell you this. Before you start getting profits, you have to get to break even and break even could be a minute. You have to be wise in your decisions. You have to be able to handle money with respect, knowing that um, it, it will come back, but you have to keep on investing. And then you also have to think about the people that you're serving. People are smart and whatever that you want to provide for them, they will be able to see through your authenticity. They'll be able to see through whether this is going to be of value to them and they will engage you based on that. And I think the values of tenacity are some of the strongest um, that you can ever have as an entrepreneur, as well as foresight, seeing into the future, not seeing um, your immediate needs as being priority, but then seeing that you can provide and knowing that sometimes um, similar to when you plant a tree, you don't immediately expect to get fruits. You know, you will go through the seasons, you will go through the highs and the lows, and you may not even get the juiciest of the fruits or the most abundance of the harvest. But the fact that you've planted that tree, you've nurtured it, at some point, someone will, and you have to keep the course and keep nurturing that tree. I hope you keep a diary because you speak so beautifully, so poetically, and I hope for the rising gens to come, <laughs> they can get to read what you say. Now, as you're saying, it's a, it's a labor of love, you toil, and obviously within that context, there are struggles. What struggles do you think rising gens of this era face that previous rising gens, perhaps your parents, perhaps their parents didn't? I call us the microwave generation or uh, the drive-through generation where with all the generations before us, they had huge struggles. They had to get through world wars. They had to get through a lot of social ills, a lot of trying to, to settle, having the dust settle in muddy waters. And um, they went through a heyday. The boomers went through that space where everything was working, they didn't have to worry so much like the generation before them. The biggest obstacle that we face as our generation is that drive-through mentality. We are the drive-through generation. We want to order at one window, we want to pay at the next window, and we want to collect and go at the next window. So basically, we believe everything is three steps. Pick it up, put it in the microwave, punch in a digit, and it'll be warmed in a minute. The truth is we're living longer than our ancestors. We're living longer than our parents' generations. And it doesn't serve us anymore to move at the same pace as technology in our minds. Because one moment we have a new phone, the next moment has been upgraded. Life doesn't work that way. We have to pay our school fees we have to go through each and every process and learn. And I always say that 
with our generation and with any generation, um, I'll use the analogy of the Olympics, which we've just come out of. When you look at relays, we are probably the next gen looking back at the person who's running the race before us. And we sometimes are very judgmental. We're like, oh, they're not running fast enough. They could have taken that jump differently. I could have do a better job because you have the observer mentality. You're out of the race. You're waiting for your turn. And you obviously have got ideas that you think are going to fly. What you don't know is you are seeing the track. You haven't ran on it yet. You are seeing the obstacles. You haven't gotten up up close and personal and seeing how high it is or how what speed you need to approach it at before you jump. And so sometimes we are quick to say, pass me that baton, pass me that baton, but we're not ready for it. And we are judgmental of the person who's just run the race. And when it hits our hand and we are ready to go, sometimes when it hits, it hits too hard. We realize Oh, we weren't that prepared. We didn't we didn't know it was going to be this hard. Sometimes we realize that when we we take off and we're now running and we realize, wow, this is this barrier didn't look so high when that other person was jumping it. Oh, this terrain, did I wear the right shoes for this? Or did I think that I could just um, push it with the shoes I've got on? So we have to be very deliberate. We have to understand that it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's never going to be a destination, never was a destination. It is the journey because within our journey, we are preparing the next person who we are going to pass the baton to. And we are running this race and feeling the experience in our own way, which is completely different from the person who ran it before us. So quite frankly, humility is what I'm hearing there. But I could tell you, I could do with a Usain Bolt on my team, right? I really could. Now, do you think that being a woman in this era impacts how one operates or works in a family business? I think so. I think so. With women, we still have a lot of um, obstacles that we have to overcome. Um, some very much personal based on how we feel about ourselves, our confidence, our imposter syndromes. We have so many spaces where we are expected to perform, yet we are judged and we are judging ourselves. At the same time, we are trying to meet an expectation that is set by a world that has always operated from a male perspective. And we are also trying to collaborate Men are not our competitors, but are our collaborators. When we work with them, we can get farther. I think there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, it's, it's difficult being in a space where we are judged uh, against our male counterparts. It's difficult being in a space where sometimes we feel inadequate because we sometimes carry a bit more. We still carry all the titles and all the responsibilities, um, like motherhood, holding up the family home and so forth. Not that men don't have them, but then with women, we've always felt like we have to deliver on all fronts. And now we're taking on the business front and we want to deliver perfectly across all fronts. It's not always going to happen the way we, we, we want them to. So... I feel like with women, what's really important is building a tribe of people around us, um, building a, a support network with everyone around us and appreciating the fact that they contribute towards our overall success and just allowing them sometimes to carry us through. When we think about what the future could look like, have you, as a rising gen, started working towards your next gen transition? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the most hardest moment in my life so far as a, a rising gen was probably the loss of my dad. He was my first parent to, to pass on. It made me aware of the fact that when we are building, we're not building for ourselves. 
we probably will never ever experience what we're building. We are building for our grandchildren. And so I may never truly experience the joy of what I am building, but my grandchildren will live it. And so preparing my children is having them become aware of the fact that they're preparing for their own grandchildren and have them not thinking as the drive-through generation, having them not thinking of what they can benefit now, but have them thinking about a future where they will not be alive in body, but will be embodied in the events, the speak, the culture, everything that is going on. So for me, looking at family businesses, looking at the products and services that I provide through my family businesses, I believe that every time when I speak to my children, I tell them the value of the work that we do, the difference it makes in the communities. I show them, I take them to work. Unfortunately, I am that mom that has always taken their child from the time they're a bump until they're a baby, until they are a toddler and a preschooler to the boardroom because I wanted to sensitize everyone around me that I am a woman, firstly, and secondly, to sensitize my children to the fact that they have a seat at the table if they're willing to step up and take the seat. That is so incredible. Okay, so beyond what we've spoken about by way of ethos, ethics, and values, let's talk about the actual operation, the family business. Can it handle the generation bridge building? It's very much based on governance. So when people think of governance, they obviously the first thing they're going to think of is corporate governance, which is dotting your I's, crossing your T's, and making sure that everything is transparent. Family governance is a whole different kettle of fish. Family governance is about communication. It's about trust building. Not just trusting my decisions as a family business leader, but trusting the decision of the rising gen as the upcoming leader who also wants what's best for the family. My ability to communicate to the next gen why we have the family business, why it's important to the family, and to also communicate the fact that as a family business, when we pass on, we're not just passing on legacy, we're passing on stewardship. I'm not working hard so that you can spend what I've worked on. I'm working hard so that I can build mass of wealth so that you can also pick up from where I've built and show your metal. Can you add on to the family wealth? Can you add value in terms of intellectual capital, in terms of human capital, in terms of spiritual capital, as well as financial capital, and to take it to the next gen? And that's all we're doing. We are adding value from who we are, what we can, what we can create, and then passing it on to someone else to add their value. And family governance is all about that. Operations is about communication. Operation is about trust building. Operation is about saying, I trust you and I am willing to share my vision, share my future, share my past with you and get it moving into something impactful. Wonderful and poignant place to leave it. Thank you so much to you, Sisi Mutendi. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been so uplifting as well. Thank you for sharing your story.